way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. We wish everyone a very happy new year and a good luck in 2020. What happened in 2020? The streets went bare. We weren't in Kansas anymore. And the death toll of a novel coronavirus tore through nations. But we all hunkered down. We hid indoors. And with few exceptions, by 2021, over 5.5 billion people got their warp speed promise, a safe and effective vaccine to end this pandemic. And that's what we got, right? The death toll tearing through nations went down, right? Wrong. It's called Operation Warp Speed. That means big and it means fast. A massive scientific industrial endeavor unlike anything our country has seen since the Manhattan Project. safe and effective vaccine. We just need to get more and more people vaccinated. And if you are out there in any way, shape or form campaigning against this mandate, you are absolutely anti-vax. My little sister just died. Her first dose. The actual vaccine formulation has not even been evaluated. The science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. They could save your life. It's the first step to ending the pandemic and moving our country forward. There's about 80 million people in this country who are not yet vaccinated. If you don't want to get vaccinated, that's your choice. But don't think you can get on a plane or a train besides vaccinated people and put them at risk. We're going to protect vaccinated workers from unvaccinated co-workers. Children waiting for the day they feel good. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Kids have a spot to take their shot. We've been waiting for this day since the pandemic hit. 100,000 lives have now been lost to this virus. I've also spoken to a number of colleagues and patients who've had vaccine adverse events. I want to get the vaccine for everybody. I want to address this issue of vaccine hesitancy. Vaccine hesitancy is costing lives. And these sources which spread misinformation should be the primary concern of the American people. Guys, 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 guys. Leave, let, let them go, dude. If you work in hospitality, you need to get the jab. If you work in retail or in a supermarket, you need to get the jab. If you are behind the counter at the bank, if you're a receptionist or positions like that, you need to get the jab. At first, if you were a Democrat and when Trump was a, uh, president, well, you weren't going to take that vaccine because it was Trump's vaccine. And then if you didn't take the vaccine, you were a Republican. It was kind of Orwellian. If there is risk, there must be choice. We as a community have the right to trample on your liberties. We're not going to just be talking about this for the next 10 years. We're going to be talking about this for the next 100 years. That energy of New York street life is what I find most viscerally absent during this strange and quiet time of sheltering in place. It's going to be interesting to see the aftermath of this really historic period. 
Supporters say mandating vaccines is the only way to get life back to normal and to protect those most vulnerable. But a new NBC News poll shows deep pessimism that may be hampering the vaccine effort. Everybody wants to say we're extremists, and all I can say is we're living in extreme times. How far can the government go on mandates, and what rights do workers actually have? There's a public health contract that you have signed implicitly as a citizen of a country where in part we depend on each other for health, our wealth, our security, and the like. In, with any public health decision, there has to be a consequence to you not participating in that social contract. Let me put it very clearly. You have no constitutional right to endanger the public and spread the disease, even if you disagree. You have no right not to be vaccinated. You have no right not to wear a mask. You have no right to open up your business. Wait, can I stop you? Hey. Did yeah. No right yeah, not hey. to be vaccinated, meaning if they decide you have to be vaccinated, we have to be vaccinated? Absolutely. And if you refuse to be vaccinated, the state has the power to literally take you to a doctor's office and plunge a needle into your arm. The vaccination Where is that in the Constitution? Is... Before we explore just how safe and effective the vaccine was, before investigating the legitimacy of mandates and censorship during and after COVID, let's go back in time. In 1902, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Henning Jacobson refused the smallpox vaccine by the city's Board of Health, who made it mandatory for all citizens. Depending on the type of smallpox one was infected with, there was anywhere from a 30 to 100% mortality rate. But Jacobson claimed he and his son were harmed from the same vaccine that they received years prior. Nevertheless, the court decided Jacobson must pay the $5 fine. So he appealed to the Massachusetts Supreme Court and lost. He then appealed to the US Supreme Court and lost once again. This set a precedent in motion, which leads us straight back to COVID. This was a disease that had a 99.8% survivability rate. This was not a disease that killed 50% of the population. There seems to be a common notion right now that the rights of the individual must give way to the rights of the community at large. I live on Maui. On Maui, I didn't know anyone personally who got COVID. I had heard of people getting COVID, but in my friend group, no one got COVID in 2020. But then in 2021, COVID started tearing through the island. People started uh, reporting uh, strange uh, reactions to the vaccine. I started hearing of people's uncles on the mainland dying. And as an analyst, things begin with anecdotes, then you gather data, then you identify a trend, then you have a thesis. So if I'm right and these vaccines are harmful, eventually they should be stopped. Some people pretend are just fictions of our imagination. They're just not real. They're making stuff up. They're, it doesn't actually exist. Vaccines don't hurt people. But you know these people. Yeah. And you were showing me some videos, and it's, it's really you know, pretty heart-wrenching to see and actually know the stories of these victims. Breathe. I had been monitoring over 5,000 people in this group of React 19, and six of them committed suicide in the past month because they don't have anyone to talk to. I have people messaging me saying, hey, I haven't even been able to tell my family because they're going to disown me. One of the people that's getting attacked the most is this young girl, Maddie, and she got injured with the vaccine. I need to take this out. And her symptoms are very severe. So she has paralysis from the waist down. She's just a normal kid, right, that's been paralyzed from these shots that changed her life irreversibly. Um, hi, my name is Stephanie DeGary, um, and this is my daughter, Maddie. When she was 12 years old, uh, she participated in the Pfizer COVID vaccine trial for 12 to 15-year-olds at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. She got her second dose. She can't walk. She's in a wheelchair. She has an NG tube for all of her nutrition. She has constant pain in her stomach, back and neck. 
So I went in trusting the drug companies, the FDA, CDC. Pfizer announced today that its vaccine is safe and 100% effective in young teens between 12 and 15 years old. The FDA has gone ahead and supported the dose of a booster shot for kids between 12 and 15. And we expect that the Centers for Disease Control will approve this in the next day or two. Kids 12 to 15 get a 30 microgram dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And that is the same dose that adults get. I was like, hey, Maddie, can you show me some videos of you just before this happened? You know, like what was like, like before? And she started showing me all of her TikToks and all the little dances she used to do with her friends. And it's just a normal, completely healthy, you know, non, she didn't have any comorbidities. She wasn't obese. She was a totally normal girl. I can't walk, can't feel from my waist down, don't have bladder control. And she was actually showing me all the hate comments that she gets where people say that she's faking it or that she just got in a car accident and broke her neck and now she's paralyzed and she's trying to get famous, saying it's a vaccine injury. All these people commenting, telling her that sh her story is fake. And it's like, you know, this is a 12 or 13 year old girl that's dealing with this. We do have a safe and effective. Safe and effective for children. The vaccine is safe and effective. Safety. A word with roots in the deepest centers of the brain. We crave the feeling. In the hierarchy of our needs, no growth, development, or healing will occur if safety is compromised. In the world of medicine, safety is a promise that the regulatory agencies are meant to uphold. When someone has a concern that they've been injured by a vaccine, the federal government has a website designed to be an early safety warning signal to regulatory agencies. The Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. We have implemented the most comprehensive vaccine safety monitoring system program in our history. The CDC and FDA use that monitoring system to detect possible safety issues in vaccines. If there's an indication of higher risk than reward for a vaccine, some kind of safety action ensues. When vaccines are safe, they do have adverse events. They do have some deaths and they do have disabilities, but they're so rare, I shouldn't be hearing of them. There was a safety signal that was generated in the VAERS database in January, February of 2021. Florida Surgeon General Joseph Latipo says, Researchers have seen, quote, troubling safety signals of adverse events surrounding this vaccine and that their concerns are corroborated by an increase in VAERS reports. Submitting a VAERS report is not an easy task, and falsifying a report is a felony. However, independent researchers began using raw VAERS data in their social media posts. Partners at factcheck.org found those reports are being used improperly on social media and websites by people who are using incomplete information to claim the vaccines are not safe. Marjorie Taylor Greene got banned for sharing vaccine information that was self-reported from the VAERS system, which is a federal database. The VAERS database is the industry standard. We kept getting fact-checked. I said, well, is this true? Should we not use the VAERS database? Where do I go? And they said, well, of course we use the VAERS database. What else would we use? This is in the category of give me a bleeping break. When did everyone get a medical degree? The FDA and CDC who overlook the VAERS database admit that fewer than 1% of vaccine injuries are actually reported. And on their very own chart, from 1990 to 2020, you'll notice nothing really changes. And then in 2021 and 2022, right when COVID vaccines became available, the numbers skyrocket. The VAERS database was built to be an early warning sign to regulators, not hard science. But shouldn't these deaths be enough to sound the alarm? So this program, traditionally, would have been halted then. There would have been warning signs, they should have stopped it, and they should have recalled it. You gotta go back to the swine flu of, of 1976. This virus was the cause of a pandemic in 1918 and 1919 
that resulted in over half a million deaths in the United States. See how easy it is to Thus, the U.S. government's publicity machine was cranked into action to urge all America to protect itself against the swine flu menace. There were 25 deaths that generated a safety signal, and they halted it. And then there was a 60 Minutes expose on the CDC director. He devised the swine flu program, and he pushed it. The VAERS database alone records, I believe at this time of, of speaking to you, 18,000 known deaths due to the vaccine. Life has become suddenly cheaper to the U.S. government. 25 deaths were a big deal in 1976. 18,000, no sweat. This was a disease that had 99.8% survivability rate. There's no math that makes sense. So I knew something was up. I was going to look at different databases like the insurance industry and the funeral home industry because if I was right, the data would show up there first. And then the data started pouring in and the data tells a grim tale. The numbers don't lie. You've got to look at the numbers. My whole career is spent basically identifying trends. To make money on Wall Street, you have to have the information before everybody else. And uh, to do that, you have to identify things before the herd. Uh, when the perception was one way, load up on the stock. And then when uh, the reality started to arrive, I was there. And if I was right, and often I was, the stock would go up a lot. And I would make money for my clients. So if people ask today, why am I here? Why am I speaking upon this issue, this topic of sudden death? It's a trend that I noticed early on in 2021. And my background is perfectly suited to identify, unfortunately, the tragedy I see unfolding before us, which is excess deaths and disabilities across the globe. Early on in my journey, Josh Sterling and I looked at some CDC data. Josh was able to figure out a way to download the data and break it down by age cohort. And when we did that, it was startling revelations. We saw that there was a mix shift from old to young, meaning about 500,000 uh, excess deaths occurred in each year. In 2020, it was mostly old. In 2021, it shifted. Millennials experienced 40,000 excess deaths in 2020. And then suddenly in 2021, 60,000, 50% more. This group of individuals ages 25 through 64 die at one third the rate of the general US population in any given year. Makes total sense. They're not old, they're getting to work, they have great jobs. So this group is very healthy and doesn't die like the rest of the general population. We learned in August of 2022 that this group, 25 through 64, experienced 40% excess mortality in 2021. To give you an idea what those numbers mean, 10% is a three standard deviation event once in a 200 year flood, as said by Scott Davison, the CEO of One America. He said also that 40% was unheard of off the charts. In 2021, the vaccine program was being rolled out. Then we would expect deaths to get less, not to get higher. The sheer humanity of the situation started to hit me. 60,000 millennials died excessively between March of 2021 and February of 2022. That's literally a Vietnam War for the millennials. In, in Vietnam War, it took 12 years to, to take 58,000 soldiers' lives. We did it in one year. My team, Carlos, Yuri, and I have discovered that for every one death, there's four disabilities that we're seeing in the real world. So these numbers are big. I've yet to hear any other uh, cogent explanations for this. Um, what I'm told uh, by my naysayers is it's dead, it's due to drug overdoses. Remember, this data is for people who received claims. These are claims paid out. So you have to have your job. I don't know too many fentanyl or heroin addicts that keep their job for too long. I've also heard suicides, Ed. Well, you can't tell me there was a suicide pact in the third quarter of 2021 amongst the most elite workers amongst us at all. Makes no sense. And then the third excuse I hear is missed cancer screening treatments. I'm 56. I've never had a cancer screening. Doctors don't screen for cancers until you go into the office and present illness. So it's not a preventative. 
missed cancer screening that that you'll see when we show this data that that's an almost an absurd notion since 1999 cancer deaths have plummeted and more than twice as many of those who died were over 65 not the millennials in question all three of these magically occurring in the third quarter of 2021 are statistically impossible there was an event in the third quarter amongst the 25 to 44 year olds. That event was a mandate. So the vaccine hesitant of corporate America were forced to get jabs and died excessively in that quarter. It's an event. What could cause an excess in a single year of 10 million deaths? Is not linked to vaccines. Well, people do anything to not blame it on the vaccine. When there's an injury, people want to find all sorts of other reasons. The same spike in excess deaths happened in nearly every country immediately following their vaccine program. Excess deaths. You've heard the phrase countless times by now. Excess deaths, something statistically greater than we would normally see. Excess death has never been higher. COVID-19 is not the reason behind this uptick. Excess deaths around the world remain high. So in Australia, they've got 9% of excess deaths. Denmark, an incredible 30%. In England, it's 20%. And I gather that that equates to roughly 60,000 people. That is one very large cemetery. Excess mortality more than expected, 60,000. That's for in for a population about five and a five point six million, yeah. you know, citizens. I hadn't uh, noticed that before. The, the Finland no. there, the the the, the, no. the deaths didn't start till well into twenty twenty one. Because lockdowns and the immediate shock of COVID began in the spring of twenty twenty, yet excess deaths didn't begin to spike for another year and a half. The only event or change that happened in the third quarter of twenty twenty one was a nearly global mandate that encouraged 5.55 billion people globally to get the vaccine. And as time passes, we can see that the vaccines offered to us were even less safe than we thought. Both the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines have been linked to rare but potentially serious neurological complications. Studies have also highlighted the hidden risks of COVID vaccines, specifically for women's health. A brand new peer-reviewed study, which came out of the country of Switzerland, a staggering one in 35 recipients of the Moderna booster shot experienced vaccine-associated heart injury. After getting an mRNA booster shot, a lot more people were experiencing vaccine-related heart damage than previously thought. People's hearts were getting damaged in a way where either there were no symptoms on the surface or the symptoms were mild enough for people to ignore. Dr. John Campbell broke this news on YouTube. He was then fact-checked for exaggerating the severity of the heart damage. Then he broke the news about the Pfizer shots. If I'd known about this graph and these high rates of potential side effects, one in 20 vaccines given, come on. 71% of the adverse events came from 4.2% of the batches. So certain batches were giving people high, high amounts of adverse events. You know, is there any way I would have accepted that vaccine? Emphatically not. In fact, if I'd known I was on the green line somewhere with one in a thousand, I wouldn't have taken it either. If they come out of the vaccine, it does what Bill Gates says it's going to do, which is you give one shot, you get lifetime immunity, and there are vanishingly rare serious injuries, deaths or brain damage, one in a million, that may be acceptable. I'm, I tell people, yeah, I'm going to get it. Let's go ahead and get it. What if it was but, one in a thousand? Uh, what if uh, one in a thousand, not one in a million? That's more one in a thousand. No, of course not. I'm not going to tell one in a thousand people to die so that 999 people can avoid the COVID. With numbers like one in 20, even one in a thousand people harmed. It's troubling to find that these vaccines were called safe. What's more troubling is the silence from the companies who performed these studies. 
they don't even tell you about this and they've known about this. You have to have an independent researcher go find it by their own dime. What? Why? Why isn't this studied? In the United States, it's very clear. It is the CDC's job. It is their mandate to look into this data. That's what they are supposed to do. In January 2023, the CDC task force director admitted they were seeing adverse vaccine injuries. We, we take vaccine safety um, very seriously. We are aware of these reports of, of people experiencing long lasting health problems following COVID vaccination. We acknowledge these health problems have substantially impacted the quality of life for people and have also affected those around them. That's as far as the CDC acknowledges vaccine harm. And their website still encourages all people six and up to get fully vaccinated. So is it fair that people hesitate before receiving a vaccine when the federal database shows a death chart like this? Perhaps this chart is misleading and merely highlights that vaccination rates go up during global pandemics. Perhaps comparing the swine flu of 76 with COVID-19 is apples and oranges. But are we allowed to make our own choice on a medical product, even if we're not a doctor, even in a time of pandemic, without the threat of being treated as an extremist or anti-science simply for hesitating? An elderly woman hiding behind a drum to dodge a COVID vaccine team has gone viral on social media. When a vaccination team reached a house in the village, What if my body cannot handle the vaccine? I'm scared of the side effects. It can't be undone. Not to mention it doesn't guarantee 100% protection. One side of the story said that the vaccine was safe and wouldn't harm you. The other side said the vaccine was effective. You wouldn't get yourself or anyone else sick. That part's true. Right? The effective question started to make its appearance pretty early on as well. That started in the uh, summer, fall of 2021 when we started hearing about breakthrough cases. Breakthrough COVID-19. Today I want to talk to you about COVID-19 breakthrough cases. Why, if the vaccine is working, are some vaccinated people getting sick? Because of the censorship, most of the public had no idea that it wasn't effective. I knew it wasn't effective. And I knew uh, also that it wasn't effective when they changed the definition of what a vaccine is at this, on the CDC website on September 1st. That used to be something that provided immunity against disease. They changed it to, it provoked immunity in your body to fight off disease. So it was a definition change. It was no longer a vaccine, it was a therapeutic. So I knew something was afoot. And then as time went on and Omicron came on, on the scene, everybody that was vaccinated got COVID. Do COVID-19 vaccines really work? Doctors tell us more people than ever before who are fully vaccinated are getting sick, and it's all because of the Omicron variant. And let's talk about the increase in the Omicron cases, because you say get vaccinated, get boosted, you're protected. That does not appear to be the case. The various shots that people are getting now cover that. They're, they're, you're okay. You're not going to you're not going to get COVID if you have these vaccinations. He was talking about how if you get the vaccine, you're well protected from having severe disease. That's true, but we actually don't know how well you're protected from mild illness and whether with the Delta variant, if you're vaccinated, could you still be contagious to other people? A Nashville woman is unable to move from the neck down less than 24 hours after receiving her second dose of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. There's been, I don't know how many people have been vaccinated and been fine, right? But we have to tell everything. Otherwise, we will get nowhere in this thing of COVID. News about COVID variants and vaccine studies were emerging so rapidly that it's forgivable to have inconsistencies in the messaging. It's less forgivable to silence the doctors with alternative conclusions, simply for interfering with the official message. 
The Twitter account of leading U.S. virologist Dr. Robert Malone has been banned. Now, Dr. Robert Malone is the inventor of the mRNA technology. What competence has Twitter got to ban a leading scientist and also the inventor of the mRNA technology? Many of us know that, you know, people who've been vaccinated are still getting COVID, you know, quite regularly. Yeah, and it's worse than that. There's a recent article out uh, from the Cleveland Clinic. It's a very large study group. It's basically all their employees um, that they tracked uh, the incidence of the disease COVID as a function of the number of inoculations. And in what that study showed in a very large population was the more of these inoculations you take, the more likely you are to develop the disease. A peer-reviewed study from the Cleveland Clinic found that the higher the number of vaccines previously received, the higher the risk of contracting COVID-19. So you could rationalize why that might be the case. Well, maybe people getting the most doses of vaccine are older mm -hmm. and higher at risk. However, that is not the case here. Most of the people in this study were young people. The company says that during its study, none of the fully vaccinated kids became infected with COVID-19. So for more on this, let's bring it back. A perfectly healthy 33-year-old mother is basically paralyzed from the chest down just hours after getting the Pfizer vaccine. Kids have a spot to take their shot. Here we have advocates of the vaccine, mainstream scientists who work in the vaccine community, who've been promoting vaccines for the health of a community. These are not people opposed to vaccines saying they would not give a booster to their child because the risks of the vaccine outweigh the risks of the disease. The kids, especially, they have a good immune system. I don't understand why they need a booster. We just need to get more and more people vaccinated. Wearing a mask and getting a vaccine and a booster should be a personal choice. This is political grandstanding for personal gain. As individuals, we have the right to choose whether we wear a mask or not, or get vaccinated or not. Thank you. I choose not. What's the risk of not getting the vaccine, potentially long-term effects of COVID, potentially infecting someone else, potentially not being able to go to school? In this age group, this vaccine was found to be 100% effective at preventing severe COVID-19 infection. A 20-year-old healthy woman who, you know, now her life has changed forever. This is Claire Bridges. She's sitting in a hospital room right now facing the unthinkable reality that she's going to have to have both legs amputated after getting sick with COVID. Claire was vaccinated. What's the benefits of not getting the vaccine? Good Morning America is brought to you by Pfizer. The paper also notes that this is not the only study to find a possible association with more prior vaccine doses and higher risk of COVID-19. Stanford had seven fully vaccinated students who ended up getting symptomatic COVID in a week span. We knew that the vaccines weren't 100% effective. Breakthrough cases where fully vaccinated people get COVID. And now, recent unpublished data from Israel showed that the Pfizer vaccine was only 40% effective at reducing the risk of symptomatic COVID. The pharmaceutical giant Pfizer was the first to cross the finish line under Operation Warp Speed. The FDA just giving full approval to Pfizer's COVID vaccine. This is a live shot, which we're about to take a look at now, of the first uh, vaccinations in New York. It's the first vaccine to get that full approval and in record time too. That has critics asking if the process was rushed, was it? What usually takes years only took nine months. The FDA and CDC approved their vaccine, and major media outlets assured the world it was safe 
and effective at stopping the transmission of COVID. To the CDC to come up with some but while the world applauded loudly, the quiet truth came and went without a sound. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market? And I really want a straight answer, yes or no, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanization before um, it entered the market? No. We had to really move at the speed of science to really understand what is taking place in the market. And from that point of view, we had to do everything at risk. Did we just get duped on the BA4 and BA5 COVID vaccine boosters? The Wall Street Journal editorial board member thinks so. They call what the CDC did deceptive. In fact, they go as far as saying that a regular vaccine should be at least 55% effective to be considered effective. But the CDC and FDA authorized these boosters back in August. And it wasn't until they got a report done from their own study in September that showed the booster was only 22 to 43% effective. How exactly does a private corporation like Pfizer convince the largest media companies in the world to lie? CBS Health Watch sponsored by Pfizer. Anderson Cooper 360. Brought to you by Pfizer. ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by Pfizer. Making a difference. Brought to you by Pfizer. CNN Tonight. Brought to you by Pfizer. Early start. Brought to you by Pfizer. Friday night on Aaron Burnett out front. Brought to you by Pfizer. This week with George Stephanopoulos is brought to you by Pfizer. This weather report brought to you by Pfizer. Today's countdown to the royal wedding is brought to you by Pfizer. And now a CBS Sports update brought to you by Pfizer. Meet the press. Data download. Brought to you by Pfizer. This portion of CBS This Morning sponsored by Pfizer. On how to find the hidden sugars in the American family diet. Sponsored by Pfizer. Here's a statistic that everyone needs to know. So it took decades and decades for Pfizer to get to 40 billion in revenues before COVID. After COVID, in one year, 90 billion. Wow. <laughs> not decades, by the way. It's not decades, it's 1849. 1849. Okay, wow. long time. 60 years. Company reiterating its full year revenue forecast of 98 billion to $102 billion in revenue. <laughs> Do you believe it creates a conflict of interest for the same people deciding the policy of how often we have to take the vaccine to also be making money the more times we take the vaccine? Yes or no? This is for the government to decide. Senator. You have no opinion on whether or not it creates a conflict of interest. Money can make the media lie. But only a wizard can make it appear that the people agree. Independent journalist Lee Fong's recent Substack piece examining how pharmaceutical giant Pfizer was behind funding groups like the Chicago Urban League heavily lobbying for COVID vaccine mandates. A, a longtime strategy of big pharma drug companies have been under scrutiny for their role in funding third party groups that kind of create the appearance of public support uh, for their products. But this is kind of an extreme example because you know, this is the most lucrative pharmaceutical product, perhaps in human history. Safety signals were blaring. It wasn't even tested for efficacy. And yet celebrities stepped out of their lane to push against those who challenged mandatory vaccines in the workplace. Do you say, let's keep testing it while the virus keeps spreading? People are dying. Hospitals are becoming overloaded. Are you going to say, let's still do it on another, let's wait another six months so we get another million in here? Will you do that as a public health no, professional? No, I, I would have said, leave the person have the choice. Not force him to take it or else you're going to get out of the Marines and you've been doing this for 14 years. Public it's health force versus a choice. The, no, no, there's a public health contract that you have signed.
nearly every job sector, thousands of workers were fired or forced to quit their jobs due to a social contract written in 1905 by the Supreme Court. The nation needs to have another talk. So the once forceful governmental approach to promoting a one-size-fits-all solution for a complex biological species under threat of a highly survivable virus isn't repeated. But we still haven't had this conversation publicly, peacefully, and scientifically, have we? Dr. Jay Bhattacharya is a professor of medicine at Stanford who once tweeted an article he wrote about natural immunity. Some of his tweets were tagged with the label of Trin's blacklist. Apparently the views of a Stanford doctor are disinformation to you people. Someone at YouTube takes down your video. Um, my guess is they probably didn't have a medical degree who did that, but they took I, it down. I wish I knew who took it down. I mean, yeah. I, I would love to debate them. I, along with many Americans, have long-term effects from COVID. Not only was I a long hauler, but I have effects from the vaccine. It wasn't the first shot, but it was the second shot that I now developed asthma that has never gone away since I had the second shot. Um, I have tremors in my left hand, and I have the occasional heart pain that no doctor can explain, and I've had a battery of tests. Has the world forgotten that science is a way of knowing by asking questions? The opposite of science would be a religion upheld by faith, immune to questioning, a dogma. So which one describes best the official COVID narrative? This is acting like a religion. Yeah. It's the dogmatic, it's yeah. absolute. It's if you do not believe in it, you yeah. are condemned to hell. It's, you know, maybe this is, I mean, it's, maybe this is a new religion. After discovering the vaccines show deep evidence of being unsafe and ineffective, after highlighting that reputable doctors were censored by social media employees about topics the doctors clearly knew more about, after admitting that vaccine mandates were promoted by and politically lobbied into mandatory status for hundreds of millions of Americans and billions worldwide by the very companies who profited over $100 billion in less than two years. It's finally time to have that talk. Brutes have risen to power. What wizard behind the curtain told the world that vaccines were the way to end the pandemic. Let's go back in time once more to 2003. The first coronavirus outbreak, SARS-CoV-1, emerges from China. It rapidly spreads to other countries, eventually killing 774 people. The Pentagon division called DARPA came to a definitive conclusion on the most effective and surefire way to drive a coronavirus pandemic into extinction. North American science spent 15 years figuring out what to do with the next COVID. It was back 2002, 2003, the original SARS-CoV-1 occurred. And so all sorts of experiments went on to determine what would be a useful response were something similar to occur. And the research was done by 2015, 2016. DARPA specifically knew and specifically recommended and passed the information on to the CDC that ivermectin in particular was the absolute number one product to be used in the event of a coronavirus pandemic. This might be one of the most important sentences written this century. Ivermectin prophylaxis reduced COVID-19 infection by an average of 86%. What it means is that ivermectin alone, if properly utilized, is capable of driving this pathogen to extinction. Give the mice the SARS type virus, 100 out of 100 die with no medication. You give them ivermectin either early in the exposure or prior to the exposure, and 100 out of 100 lived. 
It wow. was that huge. The actual research going on in the U.S. military to prove that in vitro medications, which were the two or three best, ivermectin was the top, hydroxychloroquine was second from the top, and they commented that they didn't have to do anything about proving human safety for this drug because it was already proved safe. It had been already been proved for 25, 35 years, used safely in humans. Regarded by the WHO as an essential medicine, safe for children, um, it has been administered four billion times. Uh, it's a highly effective, safe drug. 62% reduction in death when you used ivermectin from all of these randomized controlled trials. So basically you'd save two out of every three people that you treated. And I would also again argue that's the minimum of what ivermectin is capable of because not in every trial where they treated early. When you look at the early versus late, they do so much better. Never before seen military documents regarding the origins of COVID-19, gain of function research, vaccines, potential treatments which have been suppressed, and the government's effort to conceal all of this. In these documents written by former DARPA fellow, Major Joseph Murphy, he expressed that a Manhattan Project style suppression campaign was being waged against the use of ivermectin to initiate COVID-19's swift extinction. If there were a medicine that would really help with COVID, every doctor around the world would be using it. One of the things about ivermectin is it's been around so long, there's a generic version of it available. Yep. Is that correct? That's a key feature of ivermectin. There's and no money to be made off ivermectin. And any pharmaceutical company can manufacture it's it. Out of patent and right. not, not high profit. This mm -hmm. becomes part of the issue with highlighting it. After Joe Rogan contracted COVID, he exercised the American dream of choosing his own health approach, guided by his licensed doctor. It turns out I got COVID. We immediately threw the kitchen sink at it. All kinds of meds, monoclonal antibodies, uh, ivermectin, z pack prednisone. Ivermectin was one of several treatments he received, and without further complication, he fully recovered. His reputation, on the other hand, suffered an attack from the largest media companies, spreading rumors that ivermectin is for animals only, not for lack of evidence, but inconvenient science. I'm providing information that is not supported by the establishment, right? So anything that doesn't agree with them is misinformation. But what they do is disinformation. So the science around ivermectin is up against one of the largest and most powerful disinformation campaigns, I think, almost ever. It's unclear whether the 54-year-old has been vaccinated. Heed the advice of public health experts mm. rather than Joe Rogan. The FDA warned people about taking ivermectin, declaring, you are not a horse, you are not a cow. Seriously, y'all, stop it. Have you ever wondered what a coordinated disinformation campaign from the top looks like? Joe Rogan just yesterday admitted to taking ivermectin. Ivermectin is something more often used to deworm horses. A drug used for livestock. Rogan said the word ivermectin. Yes, that's the deworming medicine made to kill parasites and farm animals. Uh, who don't want to take an experimental vaccine but will take horse dewormer. Swallowing horse paste. Ivermectin is often used to deworm livestock. Commonly used as a horse Dewormer. When you have a horse deworming medication that's discouraged by the government, that actually causes some people in this crazed environment we're in to actually want to try it. He may not have gotten it from the feed supply store, but it's the same compound. Doctors say you could take it for humans. Yeah, but not for coronavirus. That's the upside down world we're in with figures like Joe Rogan. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming. There is room for skepticism on ivermectin. But it does not explain the behavior of the skeptic. Exactly what people think, and this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. What could explain the skepticism of ivermectin from the largest media companies in the world, who are all heavily sponsored by Pfizer? or the CDC's decision to not only ignore DARPA's recommendation of ivermectin, but to ignore their warnings about vaccines. In Major Joseph Murphy's emails, it was commented that immunizations of any kind were bound to fail. 
any immunization cannot, would not, would never work for coronavirus type infections because the coronavirus will always mutate in a fashion that is going to escape the attempt to immunize against it. And also being given vaccines would always create an antibody dependent enhancement of the germ itself. The germ itself would get worse. I can't believe that so many people kept their mouths shut. After learning the Pentagon warned the CDC that vaccines would ensure COVID got worse and stuck around forever, now replace the name ivermectin with the single drug that the Pentagon said would end the pandemic. And you're finally ready to see the wizard for what it is. Big Pharma and health regulators had 15 years of scientific studies and a choice before them. Drive COVID to extinction with a drug that's already proven to be safe and effective, but not profitable. Or keep the virus around forever and lobby media and government to sanction only the warp speed vaccines for lots of profit. After hundreds of billions of dollars were funneled to the top of these companies from a product that they swore was safe, safe and effective, safe and effective. The CDC doubled down on that promise and grandfathered the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna COVID vaccines into an annual subscription-like model, just as casual as your annual flu shot. Now let's say the wizard won and you got the vaccine. What can you do for your health that's cheap, safe, and effective? The message of hope is this. First of all, if you've been vaccinated, don't be in fear. Fear is literally the mind killer. I believe the human body is an amazing thing. I think we can heal from this. You need to start treating your body as a temple and start healing. And there's a lot of protocols to detoxify this from your system. The most highly provable mechanism for harm in both COVID and the vaccine is the spike protein. Its health impacts are universal in the body by causing inflammation and blood clotting. Spike protein is the component of the virus, which is now known to be the main driver of inflammation. Now, spike is also the protein which the body gets instructed to make copious amounts of when they get shot with the thing. Therefore, finding ways to get rid of, inactivate or destroy spike protein could potentially be super helpful in anyone suffering long-term adverse events. Over a thousand years ago in Japan, it's said that a man put cooked soybeans in a fabric sack and rode off on his horse. The sun fermented the soy, which produced natto kinase. Now this enzyme comes from a probiotic and it literally has blood cleansing effects. A recent study in the summer of 2022 was titled Degradative Effects of Natto Kinase on Spike Protein of SARS-CoV-2. It turns out natokinase is a super useful proteolytic enzyme which can also prevent clotting and vascular complications and has been used for lots of other kinds of problems. I have a stack of reports right here that show this supplement's effectiveness for a variety of health challenges. I've got blood pressure. I've got blood mobility. I've got fibrinogen levels, deep vein thrombosis, hardening of the arteries, red blood cell aggregation and whole blood viscosity, and I've even got spike protein breakdown, and the benefits of natokinase were slightly stronger for those that also took vitamin K with the natokinase supplementation. Natokinase has been tested in multiple randomized double-blind human clinicals with no significant adverse events ever. You may ask yourself why a food consumed safely for a thousand years is controversial to mention in the COVID era, or why health authorities caution people against vitamin D to lower the likelihood of infection when several studies show clear benefit. You might wonder why the Mayo Clinic's best advice is a brand new vaccine, disinfectants, and face masks, yet nothing about nutrition, which is foundational to health and immunity. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. We have lost the way. Is it simply assumed we should all know how to keep our health in optimal shape? 
Are we expected to outsource our health care to authorities that we'll likely never meet? If you answer these questions honestly, you'll soon find yourself in the middle of a health care system that is far enough from holistic to be dangerously oversimplified. The public today knows nothing about the impact of quarantines and social distancing, the outcome of which is an affront to the well-being of billions. And well-being itself is an often forgotten ally to health that no vaccine or supplement can replace. Yet to make matters worse, the system that enforces the oversimplified COVID rules has a violent side. Greed has poisoned men's souls. We need humanity. Just a few short years ago, the world was reminded of the deeper reasons we protect the individual from the tyranny of the collective. Tension on the streets of Lima Tuesday as riot police tried to remove hundreds... We think too much and feel too little. France's May Day demonstrations are traditionally a show of force. Three crippling coronavirus lockdowns. Anti-lockdown and anti-vaccine protesters in central London on Saturday. Collectively, we wish to live in a society that celebrates uniqueness of body, mind and spirit guiding us in navigating this complex existence as adults. But like children, we were commanded by force and coercion. We were promised safety, promised it was effective. Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson uh, do have efficacy. Clearly to be safe and effective. Boosted, you're protected. That does not appear to be the case. Ignored the alarms, scolded the naysayers. It's time to start shaming them and censor the very debates that make for honest science. Children and young adults were not at high risk. Health authorities promoted the shot anyway. Some people died from COVID, and that was and is an absolute tragedy, period. And yet the virus has over a 99% survival rate, and we coerced everyone to risk their life with a novel prophylactic under threat of job loss and public shaming. You can't shame them. Even if you don't want to, get your vaccine. Rest in peace, Wheezy. And because the signs of tyranny have caused many to remain silent, it is more necessary than ever to stand up to abusive institutions. Victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. We are the government. Politicians are our servants. And our freedom comes from a higher authority. If we do not wield it, we will hand it away. Yet the final twist in this saga is that the wizard is also in you. For they may sell you a lie, but only you can decide to buy it. Have gratitude for what this grand illusion may teach. Or you can return to Kansas and pretend like this never happened. The hate of men will pass. It's up to you to decide for yourself. Whoever you are, wherever you are, remember, you are the medicine.